Welcome to the online service of Harborsite Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join the morning service already in progress. I want to continue, and I want to actually finish up um, the conversation on Christmas. Uh, we had two previous conversations on Christmas. We looked at uh, bringing glory to God and uh, peace on earth. And I want us to uh, look at another portion of this particular first conversation at this, uh, in regard to this first Christmas. You're in Luke chapter two. Let me start reading in verse number eight. And it says, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He says once again there, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Our final conversation of Christmas revolves around those two thoughts, good tidings and great joy. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together. We ask your blessings upon our time. We thank you, Lord, for helping the children with their parts and the the positions and so forth of this little skit, Lord. And while we, we think about the simplicity of it, we also are astounded by the reality of it. It's not just a story. It's not just a reason for churches to have children's programs. It's not just a a reason to have the Sunday school devote their time to getting costumes and having children remember lines and all of the different pieces and parts that go into presenting the nativity. It is a reality. You did, in fact, from before the foundation of the world, determine that you were going to send your son into the world to save sinful creatures such as we are. And you did it at a time, Lord, that we remember at Christmas. We thank you for it. We pray that you would just bless this Christmas perhaps more than you blessed any previous Christmas, except the one that we'll be talking about. There certainly could be no greater blessing than to be able to see the newborn king. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we will stand in your presence and see you face to face and praise him for his sacrifice and for giving his his life for us and shedding his blood as payment for our sin. We pray that you would help us to take the opportunities that you give us during this Christmas season to tell people about why we celebrate Christmas. Too many folks have gotten used to Santa Claus and lights and trees and different activities and parties and, yes, even the gifts and the tinsel. And, Lord, we sometimes forget to focus on why we celebrate it. We pray that you would help us to remember that throughout the year. We ask for the children that their time would be profitable. We pray for the same, the same for ourselves. Remove any of the distractions that have come our way, Lord, we pray. We do thank you for working on behalf of so many that we've mentioned this morning and others, Lord, that we did not have time to, rem- to remember. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would just continue to work in, in our midst uh, during these last days of 2021. Help us to focus upon their message now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And the the angel said unto them, Fear not, verse 10 of Luke chapter 2, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Well, what are great or good tidings? What's one of the um the good tidings that you've ever gotten. Have you ever gotten good tidings? I mean, good news, you know what I'm talking about? You get good news. What kind of good news have you ever gotten? Okay. 
uh, you get good news when, uh, you know, you, there's an announcement we're expecting, okay? Uh, and then there's good news, you know how that process goes, a safe delivery, healthy baby, so forth and so on. We're going to have the opportunity to enjoy uh, Ellis's first Christmas, so that's going to be, um, that's going to be good. We're going to have some, you know, good news there. Um, difficult thing is what do we get her? You know, what do you get a baby that doesn't even know that she needs anything or something? Maybe she doesn't need anything. I don't know. But what other kind of good tidings? They're, they're, you're going to have a, a baby, you're going to have a child, grandchild, great-grandchild, whatever it might be. What are other, other good tidings? Health. Health, okay. Uh, and and I, I know those of you that are getting older, uh, you appreciate that even more, right? Okay, I, I do too. I'm getting in. I'm in that. I'm in, in that range right now. So, uh, anytime you get good news from the doctor, uh, that's great. Absolutely. Uh, that reminds me of another prayer request. Pray for Madison as she is um, uh, quite possibly just a few months from not having to take the thyroid medication that she's been on. It's a low dose right now. Uh, so far, I think uh, just a couple days ago, she had another doctor's appointment. They, they checked her thyroid levels and so forth, and the doctor wants her to continue on this medication for a few more months, but there's a good possibility, one, she doesn't have Graves' disease and may have never had it, and number two, she might be able to not uh, to stop taking this thyroid med. So that's, that's definitely good news, but that's uh, something that we want to continue to pray about. Um, Good tidings, health, what else? Anything else? Just uh, the, a, a new addition to home, um, good tidings. How about a job, right? Okay, I know I um, appreciate your prayers for my brother. It looks like uh, he does have a job and uh, so forth, and we'll be praying about that. appreciate you continued pray prayers for that. Um, you know, a job, uh, good health, it could be a lot of other things, right? Um, well, I want you to notice when it comes to this particular announcement, this conversation that was revolving around this good tight, these good tidings, this good news, what is it? What's it focus on? It focuses on the fact that God has come to earth. Now you think about that for just a second. How amazing is that? The fact that the God of the universe who created everything that we know, showed up. Isn't that amazing? Isaiah 7, 14, and Matthew 1, and verse 23, all talk about this name of this child that is going to be born. Um, and it mentions there in both of those verses, Matthew is referring to Isaiah, and he talks about Emmanuel. What is that? It's translated in Matthew's gospel. It means God with us. He's no longer distant, although that is certainly uh, something that we have to realize. He is holy. Uh, he is distant from our sin. He can't look on sin, but he still desires to have fellowship with sinful creatures such as we are to a point where he came to earth in the form of a baby to live among us. That is certainly good tidings. I want you to hold your finger in Luke and turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. This good tidings, the fact that God has come to earth, which is, if you think about it, again, an amazing truth, an amazing reality. John writes, he says, In the beginning, in John 1.1, 1, 1, was the word... And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, let me just ask this question. We'll talk about this for just a few seconds. The Bible says there in John 1, 3, all things were made by him. Okay? What is he referring to? If all things were made by him, what, what is the event that we have recorded in Scripture that John is referring to? What is it? All things were made by him. It's the creation. Okay, You go back to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. 
And, and it says, in the beginning was, okay, God created. God created the heavens and the earth, okay? What John is referring to, and he's referring to Jesus Christ, and this is a very important theological doctrinal truth, okay? Because there are some who would say that Jesus was just a man. Now, granted, he was a special man, okay? Um, there are some even in the quote-unquote church today who have been espousing this idea that Jesus, this man, was he was a good man, and during his earthly ministry, um, the Christ part came on him, this divine whatever it was, and when he was crucified, it left him. Now, John says, in the beginning, and all things were made by him. And he goes on and he says, without him was not anything made that was made. Now, that's a different way of talking. We don't necessarily speak in that way. But what is John referring to? He's referring to the divinity of Jesus Christ. Okay. Again, a big theological term, very doctrinal, very important, and so forth. But what John is saying is that in the person of Jesus Christ, God came to earth. That is, again, an amazing truth if you think about it. He goes down and he says in verse number 14, I'll skip down there, and he says, and the, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. How, again, I, I, I know I'm using the word amazing, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm using it too much, but it's the only word that I can think of that maybe even remotely begins to explain what we're talking about. How astounding is that? That the God of the universe, the one who said, let there be light, and guess what? There was. Everything that was created was created by him and for him. And now he comes to earth. Isn't that good news? That's good tidings, is it not? And and one of the the the... More good news, if you want to call it that. Other good tidings is not only that he came to earth, but that, guess what? You can have a personal relationship with him. Isn't that an amazing, astounding truth? Sure it is. Now, my question to you is this. How close is your relationship with this God of the universe? See, if we know him as our Savior, if we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we've gone from being at enmity with the Lord, okay, basically being an enemy of God, to now doing what? What is our relationship? When we trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, what happens? What do we become? We become his children, don't we? God becomes not some far distant, aloof, um, maybe he is a benevolent dictator. Maybe he is very austere. He's just, you know, he's just looking for the time that you mess up so he can squash you. Maybe that's unkind, but that's the way some people think of God, okay? Just looking for them to mess up so he can punish them. Well, granted, punishment does come when we, quote-unquote, mess up, right? What do we call that when we mess up? What is the theological, doctrinal, biblical term of messing up? It's sin, right? It's rebellion. It's being disobedient to the Lord. And certainly, as if we know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, God, as our Father, will punish us. We should expect that, shouldn't we? but aren't you glad that you can have that kind of relationship? Because there is a remarkable benefit. What's the number one benefit of knowing God as your Father, Jesus Christ as your Savior? What's the number one benefit of that? Is eternal life, right? And we can't think about that necessarily the way we We ought to because being creatures of time, uh, eternity where there is no time doesn't compute. How do you explain that to somebody? 
You really can't. It's kind of like how do you how do you explain the Trinity to somebody? The fact that there is one God in three persons co-equal with each other. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're one and yet distinct in their differences. They're all God, but one God. We're not talking about three gods. We're not talking about the fact that one very well-known preacher, evangelist, pastor, even mentioned, he said, now you think about this, as he was trying to describe the Trinity to people, he said, you think about this. They all have three distinct parts, each one of them. So God is, God the Father has three parts, God the Son has three parts, and God the Holy Spirit has three parts. And you put it all together, guess how many of them there are? Nine. What is that? It's certainly not biblical. It's certainly not doctrinally sound, is it? It's crazy, isn't it? Could we go even so far as saying it's heretical, heresy? It's definitely anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible for sure. But it is an amazing good tiding that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in flesh, has come to earth. And we remember his birth at Christmas time. It's good tidings. That's good news. Let's go a little further. Go back to Luke chapter 2. He says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Well, what makes it so joyful? Um, I want you to hold your fingers there again in Luke's gospel and go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Good tidings of great joy. What makes this news, the fact that God has come in the flesh, such great news and such joyful good news? Well, I want us to look at some causes of great joy. We've already talked about a few, um, you know, the announcement of a baby, um, a job, um, you know, whatever it is, good news from the doctor. Um, you know, you got, you were able at Christmas or somebody blessed you at Christmas with something spectacular and, and, and remarkable and you weren't expecting it, but there it is. It's like, oh, wow. Okay. Well, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your, fa of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. I want to pick that passage apart just a little bit, and I want us to consider as this first conversation of Christmas, it talks about good tidings of great joy. What kind of joy is available to us, and what are some of the causes of, of great joy that are available to us out of this passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, the first thing I want you to consider is God's mercy. That should bring us great joy. The word mercy 
refers to, believe it or not, God's pity extended for the alleviation of the consequences of sin. The fact that God did something to wipe my sin away should cause me great joy, shouldn't it? And the thing about it is, he didn't have to do that, did he? No, he didn't, but he did which is, again, good tidings, and it is even greater uh, when we think about it. What would happen, what would have happened, what would happen if Jesus Christ never came to earth? Have you ever thought about it? I know by now you've probably been through, I don't know, how many Christmas programs have you sat through or been a part of since you've been, you've been saved, since you've been alive how many can you remember i i don't i I can probably count them up but it would might take me a while okay i've been in the ministry now for pretty close to 30 years so that's pretty close to 30 of them okay and there were a few prior to that so uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 i'll put it that way some of you may be more some of you may be less okay but What would have happened if the story that we're talking about, the event, the reality of Jesus Christ, God the Son, come in flesh, had never happened? Where would we be? We'd probably be right where we are, right? Whether we'd be at church or not is a different thing. Maybe there would have never been a church, possibly, don't know. There are a lot of churches that, you know, that, that got started um, in modern history that have got nothing to do with God and the Bible and salvation as we know it from a biblical standpoint or anything like that. So there's a possibility that there could be people in the church, right, in a building, right? But where would we be headed? We would not be headed to heaven because there would be no Savior, there would be no mercy, there would be no grace, there would be no forgiveness, and we would still be, as Paul says, dead in trespasses and sins. But it is great joy that I announce to you that God, in his mercy, has alleviated the consequences of our sin. Now, how did he do that? He sent his son into the world. Paul says to the Corinthian believers, he says, he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Isn't that an amazing truth? It's wonderful. Absolutely. I, you can't, you, if, you, if you, you, you focus on it, you try to contemplate that and, and just consider it for a little bit, there probably are no words that would properly describe how important that is and how wonderful that is. Peter goes on and he not only talks about this mercy, his abundant mercy hath given, again, given us a, unto us a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. What's another cause for great joy? These good tidings of great joy. Jesus Christ came into the world in the, the form of a baby. That's good news. That's good tidings. God's mercy is certainly cause for great joy, but notice he says an inheritance in heaven. What is an inheritance? An inheritance is something you get later, right? Uh, generally, okay? Um, if you've, I don't know how many of you have ever, I've never really sat in a 
lawyer's office and had the reading of somebody's will, uh, you know, presented to me. Maybe some of you have, okay? You know, grandmother passes away, parents pass away, whomever it might be. Um, you know, long lost. We didn't even know we had a relative like that. And they named us in their will. Maybe it was, a, you know, a, a friend. Um, I have an uncle who lives next door to a gentleman who has no family, who is a multimillionaire. And I told my uncle back in August when we were visiting, I said, what's the guy's name? And my uncle named him, and I said, and he lives right over here? Yeah. Is he home now? I said, well, yeah, maybe he might be. He doesn't drive, so I'm not really sure. You know, he can't say by, you know, the car parked in the driveway or anything like that. And I said, because he was asking me, he said, why, why, do you, why? why do you need to know? And I said, well, if he doesn't have any children, does he have grandchildren? Nope. Never had children, don't have grandchildren. Does he have any living relatives? Not that I know of. And I said, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but I wonder if I could be adopted. Because <laughs> what goes through your mind when you hear of a guy like that who is a multimillionaire, who is also well up in his 90s and in poor health? Now, maybe that's, I don't know, is that greedy on my part, selfish on my part? I don't know. But I'm just saying. Wouldn't it be something to have been written into that will so that an inheritance later, whatever it is, comes to you? You know what I'm talking about, right? Well, let me ask this question. Have you ever thought about what awaits us when we get to heaven? What is it? Streets of gold right? We've already got eternal life, right? We've already, got, and, 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 and what we're looking forward to is no more pain, no more sickness, no more crying, no more death, no more tears, no more sin, nothing that will defile or damage, or cause heartache, or anything like that. All is going to be peace. Isn't that going to be amazing? And it's waiting for us. Isn't that cause for great joy? You say, but when am I going to get it? I kind of like to have it now. Be patient. It's coming. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, what are you going to inherit someday? All of the opposite, right? There's going to be excruciating pain like you've never, you couldn't even begin to imagine. And how long am I going to enjoy heaven or suffer in hell for eternity? But God's mercy. The, his pity extended to us to alleviate the cons consequences of sin is waiting for us ultimately in heaven someday. It's never going to go away. It's never going to be damaged, okay? It's never going to be, you know, it's not dependent on the rise and fall of the stock market, okay? how much you're going to get when you get to heaven. They're not going to look, you know, roll out a ticker, uh, ticker tape or something like that. Look at the Dow Jones industrial average and go, man, if you'd been here yesterday, you'd have gotten a whole lot more. No, it's not going to be like that, folks. We have, as Peter mentions, this joy unspeakable and full of glory this inheritance is never going to pass away, waiting on us someday. Now, between now and then, what do we have for us? Well, he goes on and he says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. 
What is Peter saying? Well, one of those things that is still is difficult to talk about because nobody likes temptations or trials, do they? Nobody likes that stuff, right? Nobody likes trials. Nobody likes things that, you know, nobody likes bad news. Nobody likes it when, you, you know, as you get older, your body starts to break down. You've got, you know, pains that, you know, comes, comes one day and leaves the next, and we don't know what caused it, and we don't know if it's coming back again, and, you know, hopefully it won't, but maybe, you know, maybe next week it's not just one day of pain. Maybe it's two days of pain and the following week and so forth and so on. We have to go through those things because we live in a fallen world. We still have finite bodies, right? But notice what we can do. He says, wherein you greatly rejoice, even though you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, through trials and difficulty. What's the purpose of them? He says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold. Are you aware of the fact that when you go through a trial and you handle it properly? Okay, that's, that's the kicker, right? You handle it properly. What comes out of it? He says there, praise and honor and glory. Too often what happens with Christians, though, even though we know we're saved, we're on our way to heaven, we have an inheritance waiting for us. When we go through a trial, what happens? A lot of times, not all the time, and maybe not like any of, is it like any of you would do it, right? But we know people, right? Not necessarily us, but we know people who are Christian people, and when they go through trial, what happens? How do they handle it? Like a heathen, right? You would never know, right? What comes out of their mouth or what they do or, or whatever it is. Certainly, they turn from the Lord. All right? Now, wait a minute. Can your trials still be cause for great joy? Can they? You're going, wait a minute, preacher. I don't know about that. I just, yeah, yeah. You don't know what I'm dealing with. Yeah, you're probably right. But I, as I look around the auditorium, I can think about a lot of trials that I've heard about and we're praying for and that kind of thing. Maybe I've talked to you for and, and talked to you about and talked to you through and, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I got an idea what we're dealing with as a church family, maybe individually as you know, homes and so forth and so on. Okay, uh, but can can trials really be causes of great joy? They can be if you let it be that way. Good tidings of great joy. God's mercy should cause us to rejoice greatly. That inheritance waiting for us in heaven should cause us great joy. Go back to Luke chapter 2. Peter mentions ultimately, let me get back to him real quickly. He says there, Receiving the end of your faith, 1 Peter 1, 9, the salvation of your souls. What does that mean? Is that cause for great joy? Salvation? You know, we ask people different times, are you saved? And I've had people ask me, saved from what? What do you mean? Or we talk about salvation and sometimes, you know, conversations about salvation. Um, they kind of go, well, do they believe in salvation? You ever had anybody, you ever heard that, that question? Um, or, or somebody will make a statement, well, they, they don't believe in salvation like we do. Okay. A lot of people think that if I'm just good enough, hopefully someday I can go to heaven. 
their salvation is based on works. And my question to some of them is, if I've ever talked to anybody like that, and I have, I have to ask them, well, how many good works do you have to do to get to heaven? How many? Isn't it going to be horrible as I talk to them and I say, isn't it going to be horrible to find out when you die? Because life is terminal. Unless Jesus comes, right? Everybody in this room is going to die, right? Wouldn't it be horrible that the day you die, you found out whether you get to the pearly gates and talk to St. Peter at this big desk or not, and you find out, he says, um, name, and you give it to him, right? And he says, birth date. And that would be important for me because there are a lot of Donald Edward Arbuckles in the world, okay? Google me and find out what happens. And it's okay. Social security number. And I give it to them because you got to narrow it down, right? And they go, Oh, man. I'm so sorry to have to tell you. You just missed it. I'm going, by how much? How much? One. And oh, by the way, guess what? There is no mulligan. There is no reset. There is no redo. There is no do over. You're lost by one. Wouldn't that be horrible? Wouldn't that be? I mean, you, you can't you can't even describe how terrifying that would be. Right. I was watching, a, believe it or not, they, they actually have a pistol competition that every year they they pick the top 100 bullseye shooters in the world it's called the president's 100 and you can get you can get a plaque you can get a patch you can get if you're in the military you can get a tab to wear on your uniform which says something about your ability and stuff like that I was watching this program and and uh, these people are shooting, you know, and stuff. And and uh, one guy, he's been he's been coming to this competition for over 20 years and has never made it into that group. He said, now, I've been 101 a lot of times. He said, and I'm telling you, it's devastating to have missed it by one point. One point, one work of one good work. But that's not salvation, is it? That's not biblical salvation, is it? What is it? Biblical salvation means, and John even mentions that we can know that we have eternal life. How do we do that? Have you ever trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you know that for sure? Well, how do you know? Because I said a prayer, and when I was a kid, I got baptized, and I let all this other, no, 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 no. I just know that I know. I know. I know what was in my heart when June the 26th, 1973, I sat in Pastor Bob Norris's office at Harmony Baptist Church in my hometown of Sumter, South Carolina. And he asked me, he said, Donald, do you want to get saved? And I said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, well, follow me in this prayer. And I meant every word of it, even though I was parroting his words. When did I get saved? Right then and right there. How do I know? I just know. I know that. And salvation, if you want to go back to Luke, you're already in Luke Uh, Hold your fingers there. I want you to turn to Matthew, actually. Matthew chapter 1. And notice, if you will, verse 20. 
Now, this is the account of the birth of Christ, the angelic announcement and and appearance to Joseph. Look at verse 20. Matthew 1 and verse 20 says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now notice verse 21. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall what? Save his people from their sins. Luke chapter 19 Go back to Luke chapter 2, but Luke chapter 19 says, For the Son of Man, Jesus is speaking, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What is he talking about? He's talking about salvation, isn't he? That should be good. That I shouldn't, I won't say that should be, that is good tidings of great joy. And it should bring us great joy to know that we're saved, to see anybody saved. I mean, what does that do for you when you hear, maybe you've been praying for this person on your prayer list for years and years and years and years. Maybe they're not even on our prayer list. Just somebody you've been praying for, praying about, and, and, and trying to be a testimony, a witness to, and every time you have that opportunity, you give them the gospel one more time, and you finally hear, what would that do for you to finally hear that maybe they call you up, send you a text message, FaceTime you, whatever. They get in t- contact with you and say, hey, guess what I did? Having a clue, what'd you do? I just trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Amen. What would that do for you? You go, yeah. <laughs> Yay. Good for you, man. Is that what you would do? Probably not, right? I can remember talking to a gentleman years ago about his salvation. He said, well... He said, I was baptized when I was, he was actually wounded in combat in Vietnam and they had him laid out there. He said, the guys on both sides of me were dead. He said, but the priest came through and baptized him anyway. I said, how'd that work out for them? He said, not too well. He said, and he, you know, I kind of woke up. He's, he's sprinkling water on my face and it's like, what are you doing? Priest looks down at him, says, my son, do you want to go to heaven? The guy says, well, yeah. Okay. There you are. On he went. He said, I was baptized Catholic when I was in Vietnam. And I'd asked him several different times about his salvation. Now, you got to understand, this was a combat veteran, a retired lieutenant colonel of the United States Marine Corps, one of those devil dogs. But it seemed like every time I talked to him about his salvation, His watch got real important to him. Oh, look at the time. Got to go. Sorry. Had a very close friend who grew up with him. They were boyhood friends. The, the, The colonel moved back to the area and lived in the same town he grew up in. And his friend was one of my deacons. He kept talking to him about his salvation, talking to him about his salvation and so forth. And And the colonel ended up with a disease that ended up killing him. And I remember sitting in my living room in Louisville, Ohio, about Christmas time. When my family and my boys were headed out to a Christmas program at the elementary school. And for whatever reason, the colonel came on my heart. And I told my wife, I said, I cannot leave. I cannot. I have to call him. I don't know why God has laid him on my heart so heavily, but I need to talk to him. So I called him up and I said, I will be there. You take the boys. I think my in-laws might have been with us. You take the boys. You go to the program. Save me a seat. I'll be there. And I called the colonel up and I said, Colonel, I don't know why, but God has laid you on my heart. And I need to know because he had a disease that was, he was not coming out of. I said, I understand the disease that you have and I understand what it's eventually going to do to you. And I need to know if you died right now, would you go to heaven? 
And he told me very matter of factly, he didn't hem and haw and go around and stuff like that. And he said, well, I'm a pretty good person, blah, 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 this, that, and the other. He said, Don, he said, I can tell you right now that when I die, I will be going to heaven. I said, how do you know that? Because I'd heard the story. And I was kind of expecting, because I got baptized when I was laying on the ground between these two dead guys in the Vietnam War. And he said, because I have trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. He said, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am on my way to heaven. And all I could do was weep for joy. Because that is good news. That brings great joy. Salvation is the reason he came. It's good tidings of great joy, isn't it? How about this? He says there back in Luke. For unto you is born this day, verse number 11 of Luke chapter 2. In the city of David, a what? A savior. A Savior was given. Isaiah 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Why was he given? He was given to save us from our sin. You're familiar with John 3 and verse 16. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he did what? Gave. Gave. His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that good news? Doesn't that bring you great joy? See this conversation on this first Christmas revolves around the fact that God in His mercy wanted to make a way for sinful creatures such as we are to spend eternity in heaven with him, enjoying all that there is in eternity, eternal life, and heaven someday. That's good news of great joy. And you know what would be great if you did something, if you did something with that those tidings, if you did what the shepherds did, what did they do? They noised abroad, didn't they? What they had heard about this child. When was the last time I talked to somebody about their salvation? I can't tell you. When was the last time you talked to somebody about their salvation? When was the last time you took a whether it be a Christmas track, and I think we have some over on the table back there, or any track, and gave it to somebody that you're concerned about. When was the last time you did that? You see, Christmas time is a wonderful time to do that because people are automatically thinking, aren't they, of the Christmas programs. And yeah, I know people often think about Santa Claus, but the alternative is Jesus Christ and the baby in a manger. And you can drive around town even in here in Marietta and you can see some nativity scenes in people's yards. When was the last time we talked to anybody about this conversation that took place on the plains around Bethlehem? When a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, was born. When was the last time we did that? Maybe it will be some encouragement to you to have some conversations of your own. Conversations around Christmas. Glory to God in the highest. Peace. Good tidings of great joy. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to look into your word. And Lord, I realize that we have all heard 
seen, maybe even participated in a similar skit or another type skit at Christmas time that focuses on the nativity of our Savior. Lord, sometimes we get so used to it that the impact of it, the importance of it, the reality of it, the truths of it don't make the kind of impact that perhaps they once did forgive us for our hard-heartedness. Taking that gift, as Paul says to the Corinthians, that unspeakable gift. Words cannot describe what you did. Words cannot convey the true meaning of the fact that a Savior was born. He ultimately died for us. He didn't stay in a manger. He didn't stay a baby. He didn't stay in a tomb either. He's even at your right hand making intercession for us. And we look forward to the day when we stand in your presence and praise you and thank you for all that you've done for us. Help us to take this message out into a lost and dying world. People really need to know. People really do need good news. People really do want great joy. The only way to really get it is to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Nothing else can compare and nothing else will cause it. I know people look for it in different ways. Maybe they're looking for it here at Christmas time with some new toy, whatever it might be. Help us, Lord, as your people to take the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ out into a lost and dying world and compel people to be saved before it's eternally too late.